Welcome to you Council. We've been talking about this tort of negligence and in yesterday's lecture I explained what are the elements of tort of negligence that you need to establish if you are filing a claim against anyone for the tort of negligence. Today we'll take the opposite side and discuss what are some of the defenses that you could raise to defeat a claim for negligence against you. We begin with our usual disclaimer that this lecture is not legal advice, so if you have any specific questions regarding your issues, you should contact a lawyer or a paralegal or the Law Society of Ontario for a referral. The best defenses for the um, negligence claim against you are two. Number one, you owe no duty of care to the plaintiff. If you can show that you did not owe a duty of care to the plaintiff, then you're off the hook for that negligence claim. Or you can simply show that the specific act that is being alleged as a negligent act, that negligence did not occur. The act was not negligent at all. So if you can show those, these are simple, straightforward defenses. If you can show either of the two, you will be off the hook for the negligence claim. But if that doesn't work, then there are three defenses to negligence claims that can be used and have been used in various cases. Number one is called contributory negligence. Number two, voluntary assumption of risk. And number three, inevitable accident. And I'll talk about these. So contributory negligence, essentially what you're saying is that plaintiff has some fault in having those injuries or harm that was done to the plaintiff. So both plaintiff and defendant have done something wrong, have been negligent with respect to this issue, with respect to the instance, and the plaintiff has some blameworthiness in this scenario. So if that happens, then it is sort of a shared liability between the defendant and the plaintiff, and it is based on the degree of fault. So the court will determine whether Number one, whether the plaintiff was negligent at all in contributing towards his or her injuries, and what was the percentage of that contribution? Should the should the plaintiff be uh, held um, liable for 25% of his or her injuries, 50%, 75%? So the court then do, does assign a certain degree of fault on each party, on the plaintiff and the defendant, and that's how the damages could be apportioned. So in this scenario, when the defendant is alleging that the plaintiff was also negligent, then it is the burden of the defendant to prove that the plaintiff was contributorily negligent. Let's take an example. Again, a common example is a motor vehicle accident. And in this case, the plaintiff claims that the defendant ran a red light and cause an accident which caused the plaintiff's injury if that is the basic scenario but let's say that in that scenario it is determined that at the time of the accident the plaintiff was not wearing a seat belt and the defendant takes the position that the injuries caused to the plaintiff were either completely because of the plaintiff not wearing his seat belt or at least in part um, his not wearing seat belt had contributed towards the extent of injuries that the plaintiff suffered. So in this scenario, then the defendant will show to the court that number one, that the plaintiff did not wear a seat belt at the time of the accident, and therefore the plaintiff was negligent in that act. And secondly, that the defend the plaintiff not wearing the seat belt either caused the injuries or contributed towards the extent of injuries that the plaintiff suffered. When this is established, there are a few things that can happen. The court may say that the defendant is completely off the hook and award no damages, or the court may apportion the damages. As I said, the court may decide that the plaintiff is liable 25% for his wrongdoing. And then in that scenario, the, the court will reduce the damages uh, by 25%, because this is not a scenario where the defendant is claiming any damages because it is the plaintiff that is injured. So the injury has been caused to the plaintiff and therefore the, the plaintiff will not be paying any money to the defendant unless there is a counterclaim for something. But in ordinary circumstances, there is no money that is going from the plaintiff to the defendant for contributory negligence. But 
if the let's say if the total value of the damage was one hundred thousand dollars and the plaintiff is liable twenty five percent for contributory negligence, then the plaintiff will receive seventy five thousand dollars. So the money is not uh, going from the plaintiff to the defendant. Voluntary assumption of risk for this defense, the defendant must prove two things. Number one, that the plaintiff clearly knew the risk of the activity, and secondly that the plaintiff made a choice to assume that risk. Two components, both of these need to be shown by the defendant to succeed on the defense of voluntary assumption of risks. And we, in our daily lives, deal with this um, scenario all the time. We all sign a number of waivers, depending upon different activities that we engage in, where we voluntarily assume the risk of that activity. So we go to, for example, ski resorts and engage in skiing, we all, pretty much everyone, signs a waiver that clearly states that there are risks inherent in the specific activity of skiing, and then we may get hurt in that process, and we are making that choice um, on our own. And we, we, we sign these waivers in all kinds of activities. You go for skydiving, you go for swimming, um, you attend, even in circumstances where you attend um, you, you are just watching a hockey game in the arena and oftentimes you will see that the ticket that you buy will indicate um, uh, on the ticket at the back perhaps that pucks may fly out of the arena and, and come into the area where the spectators are sitting and you may get harmed by that and you are taking that risk, you're assuming that risk that you may get uh, hit by a puck if you are not paying attention um, and, and in that situation you are not able to, if you are injured, you're not able to get any liability against the arena owners or the or the organizers. So we, we sign these kind of waivers all the time. Finally, the third defense is inevitable accident. In this defense, the defendant shows to the court that the injury was due to an unavoidable or unforeseeable situation, something that the defendant could not do anything about even with uh, with with prudence, with it, with due care, the defendant could not have avoided that injury or that accident to the plaintiff. Let's take in a similar example of a motor vehicle accident. That in this scenario, someone is driving on 401, and and his or her vehicle was struck by lightning, and because of that uh, lightning strike, the uh, the the driver lost control of the vehicle, ended up changing lanes and hitting another car, which caused the accident and injuries to the plaintiff. So in this scenario, if the defendant can show that his loss of control of the vehicle was really because of the lightning strike and for no other reason, and there was nothing else that the defendant could have done to prevent that accident, then this uh, particular defense will succeed and the defendant would not be liable. So what you want to remember is that uh, you know your best defenses are that you can show that there's no duty of care or that the act that is being alleged uh, to be negligent was not negligent. Um, and then you also want to know that each province um, pretty much has their own legislation in Ontario. It's called Negligence Act, which sort of codifies these things and talks about how the court has the power to award contributory negligence. And also, if there are multiple defendants, how do how is the liability apportioned between multiple defendants uh, if the case is successful? And finally, um, in our everyday lives, I think it is important to read these waivers carefully to understand the kind of risk that we're assuming and then decide whether we want to engage in that particular activity or not. In our, um, I love this topic. As I said, I really enjoy talking about torts. It's a, it's one of my favorite topics. So we'll continue this conversation, and I will uh, provide further lectures so we can have some examples of how the tort uh, of negligence uh, takes place in 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 our day to day lives now, and what are some of the areas that it may develop further. Thank you for watching.